Hi, my name is Will J. Carman. I'm a freelance DOP and camera operator based in the Midlands, United Kingdom. I just got back from a short break in San Francisco and we're straight into my first shoot using my brand new Sony FX6. This job came about because I saw a posting in a filmmaking Facebook group where a production company were looking to expand their roster of freelancers. I got in touch with them and one of their producers got back in touch with me saying that they really liked my work. They thought my style would fit really well with theirs. However, their main concern was the fact that at the time I only shot with Blackmagic and their internal team and freelancers and clients have a demand for Sony workflow, essentially. And they like to use the s tone for a lot of their projects. So from a technical standpoint, I didn't really have the camera to be able to do work with them. And to be honest, this is one of the reasons why I decided to take the plunge on the FX6. It was a purchase I was thinking about doing for a little while. And that inquiry, plus a, a couple of other occasions, kind of gave me that push to go with the purchase. So once I made that purchase, I got back in touch with this client, told them that I had this camera. And I think literally within the space of half an hour, the producer got back in touch with me and said, great, we've got a shoot next week. Do you want to come on board? And of course I said, yes. So already this camera feels like it's been a very good purchase and should hopefully open more doors for me in terms of work. So as you can see here, I'm just spending a bit of time just getting the camera prepped and getting the settings in the way that I want them to be. This project's going to be shot in S Cine tone, so not in S Log 3, because it's going to be going straight to the client directly. So the production company isn't having any involvement in the post-production. So it works better for them to not have to worry about color grading it. And after maybe an hour or so, I decided that this is going to be the final rig for the shoot. I'm rocking the FX6 stock monitor as well as my own small HD Cine 5 on top. Got a Canon 70 to 200 with a lens support and a wooden camera zip focus. I'm using a Comlight EF to E mount adapter, which I've had for quite a while. And it seemed to work fairly well. It seemed a little bit flimsy and it sometimes had a bit of an issue cycling through the aperture when I didn't want it to. So I might have to look into forking out some cash and getting the Meta Bones adapter as a bit of an upgrade. I've got the camera on a small rig VCT shoulder pad with some 50 mil carbon fiber rods, as well as some small rig rosette handles. And I'm pretty happy with this setup. It feels surprisingly light. It's pretty front heavy because of the lens, but I think once I get a V-mount on the back of here in the long run, it will balance out quite nicely. As I got back from San Francisco, I picked up two of these Angel Bird SD cards and so far I've been really impressed with them. Did uh, some test records on them to make sure they all worked. I'm impressed with how much time you get per card. I mean, especially shooting 1080p, you get over like 600 minutes or something like that at XAVCL. Already showing the perks of and advantages of having this camera and how much it's going to help with workflow and offloading at the end of the day. And I'm not sure if everyone else does this, but for me, the finishing touch to buying a new piece of kit and knowing that it's something that you're going to keep in your arsenal is adding one of my stickers to it with my name and number on it. This is obviously just to make it clear which pieces of kit are mine. So especially if you're working with multiple crew members who have similar kit, it's just easy to differentiate which bits are yours and which bits are theirs. And also in the slight hope that if this ever did get lost, some good Samaritan would see the label and give me a call and return it to me. Now, unfortunately, I can't really talk about what this shoot was about or show you anything. Everything was under an NDA and it was a pretty high profile production. Um, the most I could really tell you was that there was a handful of different crews were kind of all split into different units. I was working with another camera operator and a sound recordist and that's kind of it. <laughs> I can't really say much more than that, I'm afraid. Uh, all I can really show you is me setting up the camera and getting ready for the shoot. Um, but the shoot for us went well. It was a fairly chilled and relaxed shoot. And yeah, the camera worked really well. I didn't really have any issues with it. And because I took that time to prep it beforehand and get familiar with it, it meant that I was able to work with it pretty seamlessly on the actual day. The only slight hiccup I came across was that 
because we were working with the sound recorders, he obviously wanted to put some time code syncs on the cameras, which I did and plugged it into the time code B and C connector on the back of the camera. But having come from Black Magic, where when it comes to time code, it is literally a plug and play system. You just plug the time code into the B and C connector and it just works. So because of that, I did not think to actually go into the menus of the FX6, specifically the time code menus. So it wasn't until really towards the end of the shoot that I actually noticed that I was not getting any kind of time code into the camera. I was only getting the rec run record of the actual clips I was recording. So when I mentioned it to the sound recordist, he jumped into the menus and obviously we both realized that I should have been in free run and not rec run. So small little error, something that will be easily avoidable next time. And it's something I should have probably noticed more whilst we were recording, but it's one of those things. And in the grand scheme, it's not a huge issue. We had scratch audio going into both cameras anyway. And in all editing software these days, there's plenty of plugins and programs available to easily sync up audio that's been recorded on an external recording device with video footage. And that's why I generally like to record scratch audio if it's available on a camera. And even if you have a sound recordist on set, because even though you're not going to use the scratch audio that comes from the camera, it could save you in a pinch. Because let's say you have a situation like I did here, where you've not had time code signal going into the camera. And if I was not recording any kind of scratch audio, then there would have probably been quite a bit of hassle for the editor taking on this footage. Because they would have had the audio from the sound recordist, but no way to sync it up with my camera footage, essentially. They would have had to do a painstaking task of essentially going through my footage and trying to guess where the audio should match up with the visuals. So it would have been a nightmare for them if I had not have had the scratch audio on the camera. It's not a major issue to the end client, it's just something that would have been useful and something I definitely need to be more aware of on future shoots. And this is a quick shot of the final setup for that shoot. The reason why I was using two monitors was so that I could use the FX6 stock monitor for when I was in the shoulder rig mode and the small HD Cine 5 for when I wanted to shoot from the hip. It just allowed me to work a lot quicker and be more flexible with the types of shots I could get. Welcome back to my living room floor. Maybe at some point I'll get myself an actual desk. So just going through some bits of kit that I bought recently this week, one of them being that Metabones adapter. The Comli adapter worked okay on that shoot, but it just felt really flimsy. It felt like even with using a normal prime or standard zoom lens, then it needed some kind of lens support because you could see the play and feel it when you had any kind of lens attached to it. So I managed to find a Metabones adapter on eBay for a pretty decent price. They go for a pretty extortionate price, brand new. They can be like 400, 500 pounds or something like that. But I managed to snag this one off eBay for a fairly decent price. And I must say, there's a reason why Metabones are the most popular. I have the biggest name in lens adapters because I could definitely feel the quality of that lens adapter compared to the Comlite, so it's definitely a worthwhile purchase. It felt a lot stronger, obviously didn't have that play that the Comlite had, so lenses feel a lot more secure than they did before, which is great. So I don't feel like I'm going to need a lens support for every single lens I use. It'll just be the really big heavy ones like the 7200. One other thing I bought was this base plate from Smallrig. It looks just like a normal tripod base plate, but it actually has these four little feet that come out of it which I thought would be super useful because I don't know about other people, but I tend to have my camera rigged with the monitor mounted to the side, which obviously makes it quite side heavy and prone for tipping over if it's not on a tripod or some kind of level surface. And so often I'd be on shoots and end up having to lean my camera essentially against a wall or a table or something like that, especially if I was putting it on the floor. So I thought, this little tripod plate might actually provide a solution for that problem. And I never thought I'd say it, but I've kind of fallen in love with a base plate. <laughs> it's just such a useful feature and works really, really well. In terms of operation, it can be a little bit fiddly. It's not the quickest thing to deploy. Immediately, I was thinking that what could be useful in a Mark II version of this would be to have some kind of, have the legs on some kind of spring-loaded system so you can maybe push a button and they all just pop out and it would make deployment of them just so much quicker. 
And I even discovered that you can just have the two feet of the base plate point it out and that's actually enough to stop it, the camera from tipping over. So it's a small thing, but it's such a great little gizmo and it's gonna make such a difference when our shoes. And this is just a quick clip of me going into the menus and showing that free run time code option. Something easy to check and I should have noticed it, but it was something I'll keep in mind for future shoots. And we're now onto another shoot this week. This is with a regular client of mine. I'm not sure how much I can reveal about what we were actually shooting or about the client, but we were filming in this house quite close to where I live. So it was a nice short drive than normal. And we were essentially filming some social media content with a model demonstrating some products in this house. It was another chance to use the FX6 and it worked fantastically. Being able to use the Cine EI mode and expose with a lot on the monitor that was actually exposed one stop under the native ISO is fantastic. It's great to be able to have that one stop of overexposure but monitor it normally. It worked really, really well. And it was also a chance to use that new small rig base plate, which came in super handy. Being able to put the camera on the floor or on the table without it tipping over and just know it would stay there was such a great little feature. So already I'm super, super happy with this purchase. With the whole shoot, we were on tripods and slider. I was using my Syrup Magic Carpet Pro and I actually discovered there was a slight issue with the carriage on it. It has this quick release plate in the center of it, which you attach your tripod head to. And for some reason it wasn't locking. I haven't used the slider for a little while, but not too long. And last time I used it, it worked absolutely fine. So I'm not sure what the cause of this issue was, but it's something I'll obviously have to contact Syrup about and see if they can help me out and sort out a repair. But as you can see, I was having to rig up a less than safe option of essentially just gaffer taping the base plate to the carriage and it was not stable at all. So anytime I had to move the tripod and slider, I was having to be very careful with essentially balancing the camera on this not secure camera carriage was not convenient at all and a little bit nerve-wracking when you've got this brand new camera and it's on a rig that is less than safe but everything was fine and I took it off the tripod as and when I needed to but it's just a, an annoying little inconvenience when you show up to a shoot and a piece of kit that you have suddenly isn't working or isn't working to the optimum standards that you expect it to. And then to wrap up the week, it was a pretty special occasion where I got to go to Birmingham Film Festival and see the premiere of my very first feature film as a cinematographer. We shot it a couple of years ago. We started in, I think it was in 2021. Uh, so it was still very much in the middle of COVID era, which disrupted the shoots quite a bit. But it was a very good production, a very big learning experience and learning curve for me. It was a fantastic experience. And whilst, as we all are, we're our own harshest critics, I think there's many things I could have done better. And I think I've improved quite a bit since shooting this film. It was still a very much joyous thing to watch. And it was a fantastic experience working with Darren, the director and the rest of the cast and crew. It was just a lovely experience. So it was fantastic being able to go and experience the premiere of this with everyone. And yeah, it was just a fantastic experience getting to see my very first feature film on a big IMAX screen. <laughs> it's not every day you get to see that.